Welcome to the Seafood Nate channel. Thanks for coming. And today we've got a great honor with Seafood Annie Kimura and also Seafood Kylie here. We're both going to be talking some JKD here and a lot of the history, a lot of the uh, things that are stories that have been going around. And I just clarifying different things about, you know, the style and also the history between uh, his father, Seafood Taki Kimura and Bruce Lee and all the things that have happened since everything all started. So, uh, Welcome, Sifu Andy. Thank you. Thanks Welcome. Today. So first off, beginning at the beginning, how did your father meet Bruce Lee? So he met uh, Bruce. We had a family grocery store, and um, you know, my dad had done some judo uh, during the camps uh, when he was in turn during the Second World War. So he had a familiarity with martial arts, and... Um, he uh, had some friends locally uh, that had seen Bruce perform and had met him and uh, somehow, I guess, were connected working out with him and, and came to my dad at the grocery store one day and said, you got to come meet this kid. He's uh, amazing. And, uh, you know, my father, of course, said I'd seen, you know, these you know, Japanese martial artists and other people in their 50s and stuff. And I was thinking, what's an 18 year old kid going to show me you know, that these older masters, you know, can't and um, but they assured my father, yeah, no, you just, you just hold your questions. You just got to come meet, meet this kid. Right. Um, and, uh, sure enough, they met in a, a park in Seattle somewhere and, uh, they said, you know, do something to Bruce, throw a punch at him or something. And he said, I kind of knew I was being led into a trap. So he said, I threw some, you know, half-hearted kind of haymaker at him. But, uh, he said, you know, before I knew it, he had trapped me and had me on the ground and was, was raining punches towards me and just. He said, just the force of the air, those punches just was terrifying. And he just said, you know, I instantly knew that I needed to, to know, you know, how this guy did that. And, you know, so uh, he was uh, hooked from that point forward, you know. Wow. And at that time, that was probably more of a Wing Chun stuff you knew at the time, right? Yeah. And, my dad was, and he was a brown belt, you know, in judo. And those guys, you know, were, were hardcore in the camps. He broke his collarbone practicing. And he told me, you know um if you didn't get up fast enough they'd start kicking you and stuff so like you know he wasn't um you know new to all of that right so that somebody could close on him and take him down you know being a brown belt in judo for that easily you know says something and um you know all the stories i've heard from people that met bruce i mean i can't tell you how many incredible people i've known and seen firsthand in my life and I would sit next to my dad and say, that guy, is he as fast as Bruce? Or, or, you know, how does he compare? And nobody I've ever seen, my dad would just be like, nobody compares. Like, you just don't understand what he was like. <laughs> like how fast and powerful and intelligent. And like, he was one in a million, like one in every few hundred years, maybe somebody like him comes along. A real Renaissance man, warrior, that's just capable of it all. You know, the total package really, so. But a human being at the same time as we all are right you know we all have our flaws and our foibles and but um you know again uh just the kind of person that he was dynamic personality and physical presence you know so wow yeah well, plus a brown belt at that time was an extremely huge accomplishment judo was very very serious and there were very few people ranked outside of japan and especially for the Issei and Nisei generation that grew up in the United States from Japanese heritage, they took judo very seriously because they felt they had to actually meet a higher standard than the Japanese in Japan in order to be respected and accepted for their rank. So yes, um, a brown belt, a San Q, Ni Q, EQ in America would really be more like a black belt. Well, yeah, and he told me that some of the most of the guys he practiced with got their black belts at the Kodokan. So they were practicing in Japan and then came back here, you know, to start a life or whatever, right? And became citizens or however it happened. So, but yeah, it's just as you say, you know, he wasn't, a, he wasn't, um, you know, a virgin to martial arts in that sense. So, you know what I mean? He wasn't just uh, some normal guy that maybe, you know, because he grew up fighting and all those sorts of things, you know, being the, non-white kid in the in the area that you know a new kid would come to school and he said I'd always have to fight him because I just was different and that was the way it was I wasn't really accepted until I you know beat the new kid in a fight or whatever so he said and I had to fight yeah well it's yeah. interesting too because a lot of people 
hypothesize on Bruce Lee and Judo. <clears throat> they all know that later he trained with Wally J in Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, but there in Seattle, he also had some Judo experience and people often ask about that, about how much Judo Bruce Lee knew about. I know uh, Hiro Nishioka Sensei was the instructor for the master Judo instructor course that I took and I had the opportunity to interview him, which I'd be happy to share with you. And, you know, he also affirmed that long before meeting meeting Hayward, that Bruce was already quite familiar with judo from having trained with Wally J in Oakland and there in Seattle. Did your yep. father ever share any of that? Yes. Um, one of the people that, that uh, I don't know if he's still around, but uh, uh, Kato, Shizo Kato was, so when, that's where my dad started me, was at the Seattle Dojo in Seattle. Um, uh, and so when I was there, I had two teachers, um, uh, Kenji Yamada Sensei, and he had a red and white black and then their belts. And then there was uh, Chris Kato or uh, Shuzo, I believe his name was Kato. And he was a black belt and he was an Olympic champion. Um, and he worked out with Bruce. And I, I know Jesse uh, was a judo champion too at some higher level, Jesse mm -hmm. Glover. So yeah, Bruce, you know, and again, like it, <laughs> it wasn't like Bruce wasn't aware of grappling or that there was, a huge hole in his system. It's just that my dad told me Bruce didn't like to be touched. He didn't like, he didn't, like to be touched. he didn't want to grapple with people, you know? And, and I heard that story about Nishioka, you know, who said I couldn't touch Bruce. And these are guys who worked out with, you know, it's not like right. Bruce, some random dude, like these guys are at the highest level and they can't touch him, you know, to the point where he said, I just laid down. And said, so, well, what are you going to do now, Bruce? You know, I, you know, I'm on my back waiting for you to come to me into the guard or whatever. Bruce said, I'll just walk away, but don't get up, you know? And that's, that really says it all right there. It's like, you know, if you, if you want to hurt me and attack me, you're going to have to come to do it to me. And that offers me an opportunity to intercept you. But if you're going to lay down, I'm going to walk away. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that he didn't understand grappling, didn't want to do it. Like he'd done all of that, you know, he, you know, we have, like, there's pictures of him in a judo game and stuff, you know? Yep. So old Seattle era or Oakland or somewhere, but yeah. And, and again, you know, Wally Jay's jujitsu is, is I would say the full spectrum of jujitsu as well. It's, you know, like old judo. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like they're doing anything different today. I mean, really the self-defense aspect of the warrior arts of Japan and all of that have been, you know, made illegal in competition and all those things. So they're really not being taught anymore, but, you know, when I was taught judo by the old school guys, they said, well, this is the jujitsu portion where you would break his arm and throw him. And this is how we do it in judo. You know, they knew all those things. This is why we took this out. This is what you would probably want to do in a, a real situation or whatever. Right. But because of competition, because, you know, Jigoro Kano wanted judo to be something you could practice all the time and until your old age and not get hurt. Obviously, those things are lost. And, you know, so many because of the sport aspect, it gets lost. And, um, you know, I think that's the important thing to remember. It's like, you know, you may be a great jujitsu guy, but you may never go to the ground because that's one of the worst places you could go in a real fight. You know, you don't want to go to the ground. If you do, you got to get up. Same thing on the battlefield, right? I mean, like if you fall on your back, like you're dead. So, <laughs> you know, you might have a chance in one-on-one -on -one combat to save your life, but if there's a bunch of people around you, you're going to get stabbed or right. stomped or, you know, right. so, I mean, again, it's uh that's another thing that kind of irks me is, you know, all these YouTube people talking about classical martial arts and all these things don't work. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's something that they have going on right now. Yeah. I guess yeah. that's, that. yeah, that's ridiculous. So, you know, well, it's um, interesting too, because in Hawaii, Wally J is from Hawaii and his teacher, professor Henry Shishiro Okazaki, right. Who was ranked in the Kodokan, but also derived from, Hawaiian Lua and Filipino Eskrima and a lot of other different martial arts, Sabat, catch wrestling. So his system was also a hybrid integrated mixed system that already opened the eyes to people like Wally J, also to Sijo Adriano Emperado and the co-founders of Kaki Kembo. So there was already that influence of, of the street reality being a big deal here in this very small multicultural environment. So that was something 
that when the emphasis of judo became Olympic sport after 1964, a lot of the old school people in port communities, Hawaii being certainly one, but also Seattle, San Francisco, LA, you know, a lot of different coastal communities where you have that integration of Asian Pacific peoples living in America, you have also a catalog of quality technique because they remember the old ways because you have multiple generations that have studied the martial art. Well, and there's a difference too between, you know, I think where all this look, this hoo-ha and stuff now comes from is, you know, there's a difference between teaching an art and preserving it and, you know, and teaching someone how to fight or using it in an effective way there, you know, so if you're out there saying what I'm doing is effective in the street and this will save your life or whatever, then you're really either wrong or you're doing your students a disservice, right? Or maybe you really don't see the light in that sense, but you know, whether it's traditional, whatever it is, it's like Bruce said, you got two hands and feet and how you can best use them. And you either know how to take care of yourself or you don't. And, you know, my dad was always very humble about what we do is, you know, what I know is very basic and all of that. And it used to anger me because I was like, you're so good. You know, why do you, why don't you just, why don't you tell people, you know, I understand that now, but as I grew older, I realized, well, he mastered the basics and that's what any professional athlete, Olympic athlete, the ask, how did you get to the Super Bowl? How did you get to the, you know, World Series? How did you win that thing? You know, fundamentals and basics. And those are the things that get you through, you know? And those are the foundation you build everything on. If you don't have that, you don't have everything. And then how you utilize that, right? And what your mindset is, is, you know, what you get out of it. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that I have a good mastery of what my dad taught me, the very basic stuff, but through all of the real life stuff I've done, I've realized that it works and it's uh, effective. And so, you know, for me, it's, um, you know, just trying to, to keep in mind that, right. That the, the, the purity of it, the sort of things that Bruce said, just, you know, the economy of motion, energy, you know, directness, non-classicalness, and just try not to get caught up in, you know, all the other stuff, right. And, and remember what your, your focus is, you know, whether you're teaching, you know, again, if you're teaching kids or families or stuff, then you might teach them more of the artfulness of it rather than the self-defense aspect, to, which is really a small, very simple, you know, part of it. So. And your first exposure when you were first training, what, do you remember your first lesson or what you were taught in the original uh, days that you were, you started training? Is there any um, memory you have of that? Uh, I mean, you know, I was talking to my mother the other day too, and she was saying, you know, I remember visiting the club once and your dad wasn't like, didn't have you like doing something specific. You were running around and kind of just playing and doing stuff. And, and that's really just what 